You are tuned in to your weekly Sunday morning word broadcast, Rhema Power, with Reverend Nee Bernard Adiakwa, Senior Pastor of Powerhouse Ministries International, a program designed to improve your understanding into the Word of God, bring you practical solutions, and empower you to rise above life's daily challenges. Stay tuned. Hello, precious one. We wish to extend a warm invitation to you to join us for any of our Sunday services at the PMI King's Temple. Our services are specially designed to specifically meet your needs and draw you closer to have fellowship with God in His presence. You are welcome to join us in person at 6.15 a.m. for the morning glory service at 7.30 a.m. for the second service, which is also streamed live across all our social media platforms, and at 9.45 a.m. for the third service. We also wish to invite you to join us for the Living Manna, our weekday Bible teaching service, which comes off every Tuesday at 6 p.m. and Thursday at 6.30 p.m. in person and online, respectively. On Fridays, we gather before our Father's altar at 6 p.m., to pray and seek his faith for divine encounters. The king has a special place for you. Don't come alone. You surely will be blessed by the word of God. In Jesus' name, God richly bless you. Today I'm continuing what I started, the mystery of the man of God, and I shall continue speaking a bit about who he is and how to receive him. As I mentioned, the title man of God has been applied to people like David, Elijah, Elisha, Timothy, Paul, Jesus Christ himself. And the first recognition of a man of God is an encounter between Abraham and Melchizedek. As Abraham returns from recapturing Lot and his goods, he is met and congratulated by various people, including the king of Sodom. A man appears on the scene who does not fight in the battle and seems to be totally unrelated to the events of the day, and yet he shows up to meet Abraham, and his name is Melchizedek. Genesis chapter 14 from verse 18, he says, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hands, And he gave him tithe of all. Last week, we learned a bit about Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem, also called the priest of the Most High God. He affirmed that Abraham was a true worshiper of the Most High God, who created the heavens and the earth, and he blessed him. Melchizedek explains why Abraham was able to defeat five enemies better and mightier than him. As he blessed Abraham, he says, Blessed be the Most High God, in verse 20, which had delivered thine enemies into thy hands. So even though it was Abraham who was physically on the battlefield, the victory was guaranteed by God. And all the goods recovered were acquired by God's power and therefore belonged to God. So we see in the Old Testament, men and women who are referred to as men of God, all standing in this unique privileged position with integrity and righteousness. It is important for us to establish the character of a man of God, integrity and righteousness. In the New Testament, in the book of John chapter 1 verse 6, the Bible tells us that there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So the mystery on earth is that although all of us are born of human and live on earth, there are people in every generation who are on a divine assignment and errand. And your life on this earth will be totally impacted by how you relate with them, either for good or for bad. If you treat them well, God will treat you well. If you treat them badly, you will suffer the consequences. I want to read a verse in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2. Proverbs chapter 25, verse number 2. What does it say? It says that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the honor of kings to search out a matter. There are things that have been concealed. They are mysteries. And when you find them and you can understand them and you can contact them, they help you in your future. 
it gives you an advantage as you do well. And this is what I refer to as the mysteries, the secrets, and the revelations. There are things that you only get to know as you build your relationship with God. You cannot take your relationship for granted. There are things God reveals to them that draw closer to him. So every time you spend time building your relationship with God, you are actually positioning yourself to be able to receive things that are concealed from a lot of people. So if you want to do well in life, can I suggest to you to draw closer to God? May the good Lord give us the grace to discern and to provoke the blessing to help our life on earth. So there are people who are on the face of this earth. If they come into your life, they bring you a blessing. They will change your life. Not everybody around you is just like you. There are some on a divine mission and a divine errand. And that is why we read John chapter 1 verse 6. Very simple statement. There was a man sent from God. His name was John. Period. If you look at his lifestyle, very simple. Very simple life. But many of them pay a great price with their lives. Yes, it's usually a life of great sacrifice and stands for God. Some of them live under a pledge or a vow. Some live in wilderness and caves and live a fasted life waiting on the Lord. They pay the price of living a separated life away from family and friends, their comfort zones, denying themselves the pleasures of this world to be able to know and serve God. And they are often in confrontation with the world and their standards. As we have learned previously, three major characteristics qualify them according to Timothy, establishing them as men of integrity and righteousness. They flee sin, especially the love of money. Number two, they pursue righteousness. And number three, they endlessly contend for the faith, often ready to pay with their lives. Turn your Bible to Luke chapter 13, verse 34. What happens when you encounter them and you don't receive them and you don't treat them well? In Luke chapter 13, verse 34, it says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often will I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and you did not allow me. Verse 35. Let's all read it. One, two, go. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, you shall not see me until the time come when you shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So one of the reasons why some houses are desolate, the word desolate means uninhabited. It's dry, it's barren, it's fallow. Things don't seem to work well. It's because of their reception to a man on divine assignment. One of the things all of us must learn to do as we encounter this man is how to be able to bring them into our lives and into our houses. And every time God sent a prophet into Jerusalem to help them so that he will gather them and protect them, they rather stoned and kill them. So you find out that God wants to help, but the reception from the people he wants to help is they reject, and they don't only reject, they actually fight. They actually resist, and they resist it vehemently. I am always surprised when I see somebody who's resisting a man of God vehemently. And sometimes, what they will not do to a politician, what they will not do to their headmaster, what they will not do to a, an assemblyman or a member of parliament, they find fault, they find something, and use that to reject God. It's amazing. So one of the things every church member or every child of God must learn is how to bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. God is not coming himself. He's sending someone who comes in his name. And so you will receive a John the Baptist in the name of the Lord. You receive a Moses in the name of the Lord. You receive a Jesus in the name of the Lord. These are men living on the face of the earth just like you. But your ability to be able to discern and receive them will impact your life. In the book of John chapter 1 verse 10, the Bible says that he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Lift up your hand and say, Father, today help me receive the people you send my way. Help me to treat them well. Amen. They are born ordinary and mingle with the world, but they are on a divine mission. They carry a sense of destiny and purpose around them. And it is difficult for many who have grown up with them to accept the transition from the ordinary people they knew into men and prophets of God. But I told you about Joseph and his encounter with Jacob. Joseph's father was Jacob. But in Genesis chapter 48 verse 1, it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, 
your father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. It was going to be a life-changing encounter. They thought they were going to still meet their natural father. But the Bible says in verse 2, And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee, and Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. You've got to learn to be able to distinguish the ordinary person from the call upon his life. You know, one of the things I have learned, even if you met your classmates, is to recognize that they are no longer just your classmates. Many have matured and grown into offices that require respect. And therefore, you cannot treat them just like they were your classmates. And I found out that every time I've treated my classmates with respect, they have given me a service beyond being a classmate. So you're in the same class with the person. Then one day you go to his office, he's a judge or he's a lawyer. Respect the office he occupies. If you want to benefit from him, respect the office that he occupies as a doctor. Stop thinking of people from their childhood. Stop limiting yourself to your relationship from childhood. Learn to understand that people are growing and they occupy offices. So even your child occupies the office of an ambassador and you are going to his office as a father. There are protocols. Don't be angry. Respect that he now occupies an office for which there are protocols that you must meet. So they called him Jacob as a natural father, but he was Israel in the sight of God. He was the father of the nation. Matthew chapter 13 verse 53 narrates how Jesus was not honored by his own in his own country and was constantly regarded as a carpenter's son. Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brethren James, Joseph, and uh, Simon, and Judas? Verse 57. And they were offended in him. But Jesus answered and said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Men of God have paid a great price of denying themselves, taking up the cross to follow Jesus. Learn to appreciate them and receive them with honor when you encounter them. What they carry is a deposit of a lifetime. And when they come into your life, they will bring God's will into fruition. Shall we continue by looking at another verse? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm still trying to help you characterize and identify men of God and what they do. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4, and then verse 10. So Paul is talking about how men of God behave, okay? And in verse 10, he talks about what some of the things they do. So look at what he says, one to go. He says, but in all things, approving ourselves as ministers of God. He says, we are doing everything to make us show that we are approved of God and to let people understand that we are not just pursuing our own selfish ambitions and desires. So in all things, approving ourselves, we place a demand on ourselves. What are the things we do? He says, in much patience, much patience, we have to learn to be patient with the people we deal with. We have to learn to be patient with the people we are leading. We are not looking for overnight. It takes long time for people to even understand us. But we are patient. Jesus Christ worked three years with his disciples. None of them knew who he was. Patience. And then he says, in afflictions. So men of God go through afflictions. You know, one of the things sometimes people judge by is that if he's a man of God, why is he going through what he's going through? Yes, we go through affliction because we are men and we can be afflicted. And he says, in necessities. There are things we want, we don't have. Don't measure us by what we have. And all these things I'm talking about, you see, they are natural things, but they can make you easily think that the person is ordinary. Because when you look at your life and you look at his life, on the outward, you seem to even be better. Because he's going through wahala. He's being chased for rent. He doesn't have a car. He's hustling. He can't pay his children's school fees. And it's difficult because as you see these things, you will begin to ask, ah, if he's a man of God, why won't he just multiply bread and feed himself? Why won't he be a physician who heals himself? Why is he going through all these things? And the Bible says the last thing, in distresses. Uh-huh. So do I go through it? Of course. But these are not the things that qualify me. What I carry in my mouth is the word. So if you look at natural things, he may be your classmate, you are better than him, you wear nicer clothes, you have more money, you are going through life, life seems to be easier. But Paul says, in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. And how do we do it? In much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. And you will find out, as I begin to show you practical examples of Elijah, Elisha, Jesus Christ, all of them, that they all went through these things. In fact, Paul, at a certain point, the great apostle Paul, 
was being persecuted so much that he jumped through a window and somebody put him in a basket and let him out because people were against his life. Didn't he have personal security? Couldn't he just pray and call angels to come and fight for him? But sometimes we go through all these things. It comes by discernment. You must look and ask God to open your eyes to see because you may find somebody going through afflictions and persecutions. In fact, Jesus said, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. When I was sick in the hospital, you didn't come there. So, but he's Jesus. And they said, when did we see you like that? He says, yes, I was right with you. May God open our eyes oh, to begin to discern and to receive this man. Verse 10, look at verse 10. It says, as sorrowful, Eish. they also go through pain. You know, one of the things I've come to understand about some of my colleagues is that they go through a lot of pain and they have nobody to speak with. I mean, when you are going through some pain, what do you do? You run to the office, say, Pastor, pray with me. When a man of God is going through sorrows, where does he go? So when I go through pain, can you identify? Can you feel it? Or you rather, forgive me, say something derogatory, you see? A sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. So in the midst of our sorrows, we are still here smiling. You think we don't feel it when we lose a loved one? You think we don't feel it when our children are out of school? You think we don't feel it when we can't pay rent or something? Yet always rejoicing. We don't make our sorrows <laughs> the ministry. What I like is it's as poor, yet making many rich. One of the things about a man of God is that he strips himself to make many people rich. So when you sit under the calling of a man of God, you become better. You become richer. We make many rich. You see, by the sacrifices we offer, we help people to become better and richer. We bail people out of jail. <laughs> we pay school fees for people. We help people start businesses. We, we don't take the money to start our own businesses, but we help people. And that is why it is said that after the church has become rich, after we've paid school fees for people to eventually get an education and become, when they have to bless the man of God, hey, the same offers we give to you, the same sacrifices we make for you. When it is your turn now to bless a man of God, uh, 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 uh. because by that time we are going through sorrow. We are still going through affliction. We are still making ourselves poor and making people rich. By the teachings we teach, by the word of God we preach, by the prophecy we pronounce on people, we make many rich. And he says, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Now, if this is the person God has sent into your life, that by the grace upon his life and the dispensation of grace over his life, he will make you better and make you rich. You tell me. I told you. God wants to gather people. He sends his prophets to Jerusalem to gather them, to shield them, to protect them. What should be the reaction of the people to their ministers? Because this is where the difference comes from. This is what changes. And every church that has been able to recognize the calling and the ministry of a messenger on divine assignment, they begin to reciprocate by appreciating the gift. They value it because they see that God has brought somebody into our lives who is for our good. You see, you can just see somebody here as a pastor who is just doing a church service. And I'm sure the typical thing is that the pastor is looking for money. He's come to collect tithe. He chops money. He's living off our money. You see, but I'm showing you because unless your eyes open, if you have the concept of the world, you need to be able to renew it to be able to appreciate what God is doing in your life. The only way you'll be able to receive and be able to reciprocate, because I told you, the way you treat him is going to directly impact your life. I've shown you the price he has paid to be who he is, leaving his comfort zone, denying the cross, giving up his career, living a lot to be able to carry the word of his God in his mouth to come and teach you. What is the value you place on somebody God has sent into your life? Maybe in the next few weeks I'll teach you how Israel saw David and why David was such a great king. So sometimes you are sitting before somebody God has sent, but it's very casual and it's indifferent. But he says, yet making many rich. We make many rich. And yet, he says, having nothing and yet possessing all this. Because our satisfaction is to see people do well. So you will find out that in some of the churches, when it's time to appreciate the pastor, it's on another level. Because they even realize that no matter what we give to him, the more we give to him, the more we are blessed. The more we appreciate the gift that God has sent. And the more we receive it, as many as received him, to them, God all of a sudden gives them power to become. So they were not, but they received him. And then they also received the power to change their lives. You see, a church that is miserly or stingy <laughs> or holds back from blessing its pastor or its man of God, it's a church that will remain desolate. Because what changes the, or what breaks the back of a 
the negative side of is your ability to receive the man of God. That's why I read John chapter 1. He was in the world. The world knew him not. He came unto his own. His own knew not. That's one of the saddest stories about Israel. That the presence of God was with them to do so much. The great and mighty God. To do so much for them. Yet they couldn't receive him. Today, we stir up the wells in the spirit. That there shall be a quickening and a discernment. There shall be an opening of our eyes to see God. Turn your Bible with me quickly to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18 from verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Verse 2. And he lifted up his eyes and looked. And lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself unto the ground. Who are we talking about? Abraham. Abraham is one person who speaks with God directly. He's a great man by all standards. And yet, Abraham recognizes men of God. He has a relationship with Melchizedek. And yet, he's also looking at the relationship with these men. These are men sent on a divine assignment to Sodom and Gomorrah by God himself to go and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. They don't know Abraham and Abraham doesn't know them. Yet, Abraham sees them and sees something beyond three mere men. And the Bible says that he ran to meet them from the tent door and he bowed himself toward the ground. I mean, you are Abraham. You are the richest man on earth. You have the most beautiful wife on earth. You have everything you need on this earth. You don't need these three men who are stragglers walking through your town. But God opens Abraham's eyes and Abraham sees something that a lot of people don't see. So the Bible says that Abraham is a rich man. He ran. He didn't even sit down and say, I mean, if you're a rich man in your house and you see people coming, okay, let them come. But Abraham gets up, runs to meet them. And what does he do? He bowed himself to the ground. What does Abraham see that you don't see? Why should Abraham, the rich man, recognize anybody? Why should Abraham bother himself? Verse 3. And said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you. Look at the language of Abraham. Talking to three men who seem to be strangers who are visiting his town. He says, And let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort you your heart. After that, you shall pass on, for this is why you are come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. I mean, the whole encounter is a bit surrealistic. This is Abraham we are talking about. He has met Melchizedek. The guy has met senior, and yet he meets another group of three men who are tired. So you see, the people got sent tired in necessity. They want food, they want water. And they've come to Abraham's town. And Abraham is sitting down, rich man. Everybody knows him. And yet he rises up and he runs towards them and he bows down and he begins to talk to them like a small boy. Wow. Verse 6. And Abraham hastened into the tent. You see, I like the kind of adjectives. Run. Hastened. The verbs that have been... It's not somebody who is just walking around giving orders. He runs himself. He hastens. I mean, can you meet a man of God? Can you? Can you run? Can you hasten? Sometimes you see somebody who is an ambassador, and yet he he meets a man of God, and all of a sudden he he sees himself as small. Because there are encounters you must respect. I know that when you see an ambassador kneeling down, you may think, oh, he's been jinxed. And I know that that's what the world thinks. When you start coming to church and you start doing things, people start insulting you. Because it's as if you are following a man, you are worshipping a man, you have nothing to do. But I can see Abraham hastening, running, going to his wife and saying, the wife hasn't planned to cook, but he says, you must cook. Why? Because I've met some people, I believe they're on a divine assignment. Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes upon the head. Seven. And Abraham ran unto the head, fetched a calf tender and good, and gave it to a young man. And he hasted. He hasted to dress it. Wow. Verse eight. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. Whilst they were eating, where was Abraham? Standing by them. He's not sitting down. He's not relaxed. He's willing to serve them. There are a lot of things that I don't know, but I watch. And I'm very slow to speak about them, especially when I don't know. Because if you are not careful, the first thing you'll see is negativity. All of a sudden, why are all these big men behaving like fools? Mm, Isn't it? All these managing directors, look at how they are running to the church. And they come and kneel down. And look at them. When they finish church, they are around. They are like, they don't have anything to do. Yes. Why? Because God has opened your eyes to see something that a lot of people don't see. And I know that the way I treat him will impact my life. So what would you do if you met a man of God? Come around late. 
ignore him. This is the attitude of the Israelites. He came unto his own. They ignored him. They were indifferent. They didn't mind him. But as many, but there were some people who were different. They didn't follow the general. They found life. It wasn't the men who went to Abraham and said, oh, give us some food to eat. We are hungry. No, men of God will never beg. And I'll show you. We are going to look at it. Because if you look at the story of the uh, Shunammite woman with Elijah, it was the woman who constrained and begged Elisha to come and eat. These are people on divine assignment. God has sent them. They didn't have anything to do with Abraham. But Abraham intercepted them. Verse 9. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. So the guys would have passed by. Sarah would have stayed there. Abraham would have stayed in his house. But all of a sudden, by Abraham's gesture of hospitality, he arrested them. And all of a sudden, they asked, Where is your wife? Abraham never went and said, Come and do something with my wife. Abraham didn't go because he had a need. He first ministered. These are secrets you must learn. Oh, he first ministered. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. Verse 16. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on their way. These were men on assignment to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But their mission was intercepted and delayed by Abraham. Hey! Let's look at another example. Second Kings chapter 4. The story of Elisha with the Shunammite woman. Second Kings chapter 4 verse 8. God help us to transition to the next stage of our lives. Where things will become easier. Where life will become easier because the person God has sent into our life has come and has been received. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 8. One to go. And it fell on the day that Elisha passed to Shunem where there was a great woman and she constrained him to eat bread. And it was so that as often as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. What is the characteristic of the woman? Great woman. Not an ordinary person. Great woman. What happened? And she constrained him to eat bread. What happened? She constrained him. What does it mean to constrain? It means that Elisha was not ready to go. But what did the woman do? Persistently, consistently, urging, forcing. So one of the things about a man of God is usually many of us are very private and we don't want to expose ourselves. So we'll rather go on on our assignment in hunger and pain without telling anybody what we are going through. I told you, in necessities, in afflictions, in distresses, we don't talk to anybody, but we are still ministering. So Elijah is passing through, not asking anybody for anything. He comes to do what God has called him to do and then he goes back. All the people he goes to minister to, he leaves them and goes back. He doesn't tell them anything. Then a certain woman, who the Bible calls a great woman, sees something and says, no, 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 no. And so she goes to the guy and says, oh, today you're passing, come by. Says, no, 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 I have to go. I've got to go. I've got to leave. So this great woman constrained. She constrained. Oh, okay, I'm going to give the man a uh, When I gave it to him, he said he didn't want it. So, I mean, I needed it. And I took it away. You see? Many people won't even offer. I remember there was somebody who came to preach in church. And I went to him and I, I knelt down and I had an offering. I said, look, he said, no, no, no. no. I don't. He said, that's not why I came to preach. He told me. He said, that's not why I came to preach. I don't want it. And I said, sir, I beg you. I believe in you. This is what I believe in. I want you to. If you don't take it, I won't leave. Abraham had a prophecy of God on his life, but these three men were the fulfillment. It was after this that Sarah conceived, and a year later. There are some things you can't take for granted in life. Oh, after it's my money. Why should I send my money to a pastor? Well, the pastor cried. He was in a hurry, so I didn't even have time. You see, you constrain the house. Abraham was going to laugh. A prophecy he had been waiting for. The house had remained desolate until he began to recognize men of God. You are a man of God. You are also a child of God. You have access to God and everything. But you also recognize that God sends people on a divine assignment. We'll continue next week. Put your hands together for the Lord. Hello, precious one. We wish to extend a warm invitation to you to join us for any of our Sunday services at the PMI King's Temple. Our services are specially designed to specifically meet your needs and draw you closer to have fellowship with God in His presence. You are welcome to join us in person at 6.15 a.m. for the morning glory service, at 7.30 a.m. for the second service, which is also streamed live across all our social media platforms, and at 9.45 a.m. for the third service. We also wish to invite you to join us for the Living Mana, our weekday Bible teaching service, which comes off every Tuesday at 6 p.m. 
on Thursday at 6.30 p.m. in person and online, respectively. On Fridays, we gather before our Father's altar at 6 p.m. to pray and seek His face for divine encounters. The King has a special place for you. Don't come alone. You surely will be blessed by the Word of God. In Jesus' name, God richly bless you. Thank you for listening to Rhema Power with Reverend Me Bernard Adiakwa. We hope you've been blessed. For further information, contact 0303-931-841. Tune in next week for another insightful teaching on Rhema Power.